Well, I think you're a bigger table now. Go first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do with that hard space underneath the stairs? Right, you're fine. Because some of you remember the blue wall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so all we have. Right. Very small. Three fourths of the legislature didn't know what the blue wall was, right? <laughs> i got to tell a couple stories so they can live on. <laughs> you should. You should. All right. And there's a table right there for us. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. We want you to see this tax bill. Here we go. We are signing Sign the spreadsheet. The <laughs> and what day is it today? Today is May 21st. All right. All right. All right. This is what we're planning out of this conference. Out of our And the only possible committee. change would have to be by leadership at this point. Great. Well, I'm Senator Carla Nelson. Great to be here, a Senate tax chair. Glad to be with my colleague, Fantastic. Chair Mark Hort. I want to tell you something. We have worked hard to put together a terrific tax bill. A tax bill in a time when the state is sitting on, on historic, unimaginable resources. We've got $9.25 billion in our forecast, but as you know, revenues have continued to increase monthly uh, since that. And at the same time, Minnesota, Minnesota parents, Minnesotans all across our state are suffering with record high gas prices, staggering inflation, food costs are up 9%, and quite frankly, it is our duty to get these resources back into the hands of Minnesotans to help them better afford their lives during this time of such skyrocketing inflation. The agreement that we have come to, it's a four, well, actually, leadership came to that. I'm going to let Chair Marquardt talk about that leadership decision, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about what's in our bill. Sure. So, well, first of all, thank you, Senator Nelson. It's been great working with you in the conference committee here. Uh, and this is an historic tax bill. Uh, we have in this bill the largest tax cuts in the history of this state. And it's going to positively impact in a real and meaningful, meaningful way uh, families and uh, senior citizens and businesses across the state. And the important thing to remember is this is part of an agreement. You know, there was a an agreement among the governor, the majority leader, and the speaker of the house. This is part of that agreement. And before you can move forward with any part of the agreement, all the parts of the agreement have to be completed. And so Senator Nelson and I and the conference committee here urges all of the other areas that are working to get their job done so we can complete the agreement and then uh, move this forward. Thank you. Yes, we must not let this transforming historic tax bill be held hostage by many of these other things. So let's just give you a few of the numbers. $3.88 billion in income tax cuts. In addition, over $350 million in property tax reductions. Vast majority of this bill, about 97% of this bill, is in income tax. I'm going to give you just a few of the things that are in the bill and just to describe how these are going to help everyday Minnesotans. Number one, Minnesota seniors are never again going to see their Social Security checks taxed. It is time that we join the more than 30, likely 39 states that do not tax Social Security benefits. Minnesotans bought those benefits for years with their taxes taken out of their paycheck year after year. And how ironic that it comes time to get those 
benefits, and then Minnesota is one of the few states that is taxing them. That is a critical piece. We've been trying to do this for decades. Now is the time that we are doing, going to do this. And that will impact 460,000 middle class seniors in Minnesota, never seeing another dollar taken out of their Social Security benefits. 2.4 million filers will see an income tax reduction, permanent income tax reduction every paycheck, year after year. 81,000 working families will see relief through the expanded child and dependent care credit. The average tax relief is $825 per family. 38,000 additional filers will qualify for the expanded K-12 credit. Average tax relief $30, $300 per family. And then we have, I'm gonna let uh, Chair Marquardt talk a little bit about the expanded renter's refund. That's an important uh, provision that came over from the House. And then I'm going to turn it over to Senator Weber our property tax subcommittee chair in the Senate to talk a little bit about the property tax relief in this bill. So thank you, Senator Nelson. So a couple other big components is, one thing we do is we move the renter's refund, as it was, uh, that used to get in August, back to an income tax credit that now they can get sooner, it's simpler, allow more people uh, to that will know that it exists. It is a huge benefit uh, to senior citizens, uh, where we are also moving from household income to adjusted gross income, and when they file for their renter's credit, they don't have to count non-taxable Social Security. That is gonna be a huge benefit uh, for senior citizens, huge benefit uh, for families. So uh, this will provide about $300 million of relief uh, to folks that now uh, as we move it to the renter's credit. It goes from a refund to a tax cut. Another big part that we have is the Great Start Child Care Credit, which will allow if a family uh, up to about 105,000 income, that they would get up to $2,000 per child between birth and the age of four. $2,000 credit for one child, $4,000 credit for another child. So if you take a family uh, of three, that has one child who's three years old, they make about $80,000, uh, this would be about an 80% tax cut for that uh, family. It's significant. Um, before I also, we have uh, Chair Joachim, who was very instrumental in the property tax portion. I wanna mention, that in the next two years, there is over $600 million of property tax cuts in this bill. It's the largest property tax cuts for homeowners and renters uh, in the last 20 years. It is significant, and you're hearing a lot right now about rising market values going through the roof. This will help senior citizens stay in their homes. This will help families be able to stay in their neighborhoods and be able to uh, look at other things, so uh, that is crucial. But the thing to remember about this bill, the largest tax cut by far in the history of this state, and as Chair Nelson mentioned, for the first time in almost 40 years, senior citizens will not pay one dime on their, of tax on their Social Security benefits. And it is a huge benefit to working families who are struggling to pay for childcare costs and others. So with that, we'll turn it over to our property tax folks uh, and talk about their wonderful work. Good. <laughs> I'm Representative Cheryl Joachim, a property tax division chair in the House and representing Hopkins and St. Louis Park. And I cannot tell you how excited I am about the property tax cuts we have in this bill. Whether you are a senior trying to age in place or a young, um, a young person starting out with a new career, trying to find a place to live and, and facing huge rents, or if you're a starting family with kids in daycare, and our Great Starts credit will help you, as well as the increase we have in property tax refunds. The increase in property tax refunds really focuses in on those making between 21,000 and 71,000. So those are our starting teachers, our starting nurses, um, folks that are young professionals that need some help. 
We also um, uh, improve the senior deferral program so that we raise the income level. But more importantly, we move that down from 15 years that you have to be in your home to five. So those seniors that are transitioning out of bigger homes into smaller homes hit 65 and can't use that tool anymore. Now they can. So very excited about that. We increase um, our targeted tax, uh, property tax uh, program, and we also um, work on improving our homestead exclusion, which I'll let Senator Weber talk about. But we're very excited, and we also have, you can tell I'm really excited, um, we also increase our local government aid. It was my hope we could also adjust and uh, update the formula this year, but it just gives us something to work on together next year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Weber. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Senator Bill Weber from Senate District 22, southwest corner of Minnesota. Uh, indeed, uh, a few number of years ago, prior to my arrival in the legislature, the old homestead credit was, was stopped uh, in terms of property taxes and a homestead value exclusion was created. Uh, and so this year, uh, in March and April, on the heels of our real estate tax statements, people started to get their real estate valuation notices. And obviously, we have seen a substantial increase in almost all levels of real estate values. And so the measure that we took was for the uh, homestead value exclusion, we have raised those limits to by 25%. Uh, in addition, we have raised the ag homestead amount from approximately 1.89 million to 2.5 million, and we have raised the what we call the Pa and Ma uh, resorts. Uh, they have a, a special homestead value if they're living on their resort and running it uh, as well, and we've raised that uh, from approximately 600 and some thousand dollars to 850 thousand dollars, and uh, and hopefully we will be able to moderate uh, those. Uh, uh, those property taxes in that way. The one thing about property taxes is that if you shift value of any type, you, you also shift it to something else. Uh, it's a proverbial pebble in the pool. You throw the pebble in and, and, and the ripples keep going out and affecting other property. And, uh, and so it was really important that also included uh, was a reduction of the, of the state general tax levy on commercial, industrial, and seasonal recreational properties. That is the only real estate tax money that the state of Minnesota collects. And on both of those categories, uh, basically it, it amounts to approximately $760 million a year. And so there is $75 million of um, allowance here to reduce the state general levy in order to assist in any shifts of those kind of property taxes that occur. Uh, this, uh, I believe, is going to be important for many of our property owners, and the targeted uh, tax, uh, property tax refund that Chair Joachim mentioned is also important for those who may not fall into any of these other categories, but if they see a substantial rise in their real estate taxes, it's a, it's a credit or a refund that's allowed them, regardless of their income level, as long as their property taxes go up more than 10% with an increase uh, of at least $100. And so, and, uh, so this is an important property tax uh, adjustment that we've made all across the board, and, and we're hoping we will be able to mitigate any of the problems that higher values uh, and higher real estate taxes will create. I did want to, I forgot to mention, I know um, Chair Marquardt went over the renter's credit, but this really is transformational for a lot of families. Not only do we move to adjusted gross income, but there was a way to move it to the income tax, so it makes it a lot easier for people to apply for. And statewide, um, this isn't just, this is helping, the magnitude of people this is helping, it's hard to quantify, but I can tell you statewide, the average 30% of the folks that get renter's credit are seniors or those who are disabled. In over 20 of our counties, that goes up to 50%. So this really is going to help folks um, with their rental, the high rent increases that we're seeing as well as the high property taxes. What is the total amount again of the property tax? Is it 380, 380 million, did you say, or what was the number? For property tax. Oh, did you have that? No, I think, so if you count uh, the renter's credit, which is applying, it is uh, over $600 million. Okay, so it's over 600 in, in the next property two tax years relief. Okay. property tax cuts in the next two years. Right. Why did the Walls checks fall by the wayside? Neither side, neither yeah. the House Democrats or Senate Republicans yeah. were ever keen on it. Did the governor even push for that he, in the end? He did. And so the House plan, of course, we had a rebate uh, on uh, child 
tax credit, basically, rebate on, on children under 17. So we had that in our bill. It wasn't quite the same, but it was a rebate that would go out. Uh, the walls rebate was offered in our first house offer. But just because of the amount of money that is in the first biennium, there isn't enough to do that. But it certainly uh, was a priority for the governor, certainly, and it was a priority for the house to get some rebates, but that did not occur. It was not a priority in the Senate. Uh, we felt that those were, in a sense, gimmicks, one-time one time money. And uh, Minnesota, no matter what indice you look at, is one of the highest tax states in the nation. And we felt with uh, $12 billion, if you look at uh, including our reserves as well, I'm just, uh, it was time that Minnesota really right-size its tax code. And in the Senate, we believe that Minnesota families Minnesota businesses, Minnesota seniors, Minnesotans needed tax relief. And they needed it now, right now, because of the inflationary pressures, but they need it ongoing. So what you see in this bill is significant, ongoing, permanent tax relief that will empower Minnesotans and will spark uh, economic growth. Well, yeah, Tom, Tom, I should say something on that. I, I was here, and President Marco was here, when we did the Jesse checks, and. I was, Doug Johnson was my senator, I watched him be the architect of how to do that. And when we did it that year, uh, we created a very special sales tax rebate that was not subject to federal taxes. I have no idea why the governor proposed uh, a one-time check for everybody, but the way his proposal was crafted, people would have been pretty darned upset when they went to their tax account and next winter and found out they had to pay federal income taxes on that check that they received. So it really, in the Senate, we felt it really wasn't a, a, it, it wasn't a real thought through proposal. Why we would have wanted to send that much of our surplus to Washington, I, I think people would have been pretty disappointed. Uh, we haven't seen the bill yet, uh, so can you tell us the uh, income tax cut and the uh, Social Security repeal, do they take effect uh, upon enactment, or is there some lag time at revenue before those would take effect? Yeah, all these provisions would uh, come into effect for tax year 22. So next year, when people start filing, it would apply for tax year 2020. Would lower withholding start right away, though? Or No, no, okay. there's no lower withholdings on this, um, I don't well, believe I unless the... I think you're talking yeah, no, about the, tax the income cut tax, tax reduction. Yeah, yeah. 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 and yeah. it's for tax year 2022. Yeah. So, so, the, so the question is, would employers, I mean, you're going to get a couple dollars extra, you know, on a paycheck, no, essentially. It so. takes effect in, 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 ta in year 2022, but it's tax year 2023 when you pay your taxes. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, that, if that takes effect, that could happen. I'd have to check for sure to see if there'd be withholdings on that, um, how that would take effect. So uh, if it's the income tax rate... Um, yeah, that's, we'd have to, yeah, it, it would, I don't think it would, yeah. So it's not going to change your, your take-home pay right now. No. It'll be when you file your taxes. I, I believe right. that, that's the way we have it. So when you file is when you would get that rate cut. Did someone talk about the income uh, rate reduction? How much might that amount to? And it sounds like it's 2.4 million filers. Is that all? It's not all filers? No, all income tax filers. If you, 20% uh, of Minnesotans do not pay income tax. Uh, they get sometimes refund refundable credits, but 2.4 million filers, everyone who files income taxes will see an income tax reduction, a a about 0.25% uh, permanent ongoing tax reduction. Your original target was 1.6 billion for next year, 2.4 for the following biennium. Did you fit within those targets? Uh, yes and no, yes. <laughs> So in the first biennium, we're actually about $150 million to the good. Uh, in the second biennium, we're about $47 million over the $2.4 billion. So the total bill is uh, roughly about $3.9 billion. Uh, the renter's credit, um, does it increase income, the, the amount of income where it's capped? where you're not eligible right now, it does, it does not change that? The current, we do not change any current um, requirements or guidelines in the bill. So that chart you'll see on income, it's still a maximum of 68,000 that's indexed every year 
with inflation. But none of that was changed. The reason for the, the increase, or some is why it provides extra relief, is moving from a household income to an adjusted gross income, there's certain income now you do not have to count anymore. So instead of, let's say, having to put down as 50,000 as your income, if you got $36,000 in non-taxable Social Security instead of 50,000, now you only have to put down 14,000, and of course the lower your income, the higher the refund. So. Uh, for seniors who may have a, a husband and wife who have 36000 let's say, um, some of the calculations on a eight $900 uh, a month rent or whatever that might be is up to around $1,000 of an increase uh, credit that they would receive otherwise. And the other big thing is the Department of Revenue feels, because it will go on the income tax form, that another 120,000 renters who are currently eligible now will uh, realize they're eligible and apply for that credit. Some Democrats have not wanted to do the full repeal of the Social Security tax because they feel like it helps uh, seniors who are making more money. Can you talk about why in the end you decided to agree to do that, to do the full repeal, since that wasn't, you wanted to do something else with that? That was a priority in the House. In fact, uh, Representative Les Lagarde right here carried that bill for full inclusion, and we had Representative Les Lagarde and Senator Bach was the Senate author. Uh, <laughs> they both carried, we heard that bill in the House. And so that was always a priority. The matter was always cost. And so now the fact that we have a target that we can do that, uh, folks like uh, Representative Lesegard and Senator Bach, who have led the way on this, we can now uh, do that. But it's always been a goal from the Democrats. This has always been a bipartisan goal to finally do that. And this is where you can finally, you know, uh, turn off the trough on this one. That tax situation is done. Senior citizens will never pay another dime of tax on their Social Security benefits. And, Thank you to Representative Les Lagarde, Senator Bach, uh, and uh, Senator Nelson, and, and the House and Senate coming together on this, and, and Governor Walz. So do you think then a lot more, there will be those Minnesotans who've lived six months and one day someplace else, will they live here in Minnesota more? Well, yeah. we, you know, that we don't have like that kind of dynamic scoring here. We don't know. There's many other reasons Minnesotans might choose to be here only just under six days could be our top tier income tax rate, for example. But we do think it will, we do believe that we will see less Minnesotans who are lured to other states uh, because of not taxing their Social Security. All you have to do is look at our neighboring, our neighboring states uh, for, for the very most part do not tax Social Security. If you look to our southern border, you'll know that Iowa, which has not taxed Social Security for a number, Social Security benefits for a number of years now, has fully exempted all retirement income from taxation. We were becoming an island of how we taxed our seniors. So I think this helps us. Uh, but we don't, we don't know what that, uh, we can't quantify the effect on how many seniors will continue to stay in Minnesota. We do know that we don't compete on the weather, but we know that Minnesotans, <laughs> many Minnesotans don't want to leave Minnesota. They love Minnesota, but for all too long, their CPAs have had to kind of go through these gyrations, and basically they've often said, well, it's hard for you to, to live here financially when you can live in one of these warmer states and, and provide more for your heirs, for example. Sometimes I've even heard them say, well, if you want, you can, you can afford to maybe afford to stay in Minnesota when you retire, but you certainly can't afford to die there. So I'm just saying we have to be very careful to make sure that we try to keep our seniors, and I think this will be one way to do that. One of the metrics that uh, you guys have referred to is where Minnesota ranks compared to other states in total tax burden, uh, maybe number 11 or something like that, depends what, what year you look at. Do you guys know, have you done an analysis to see how this might actually change our ranking on any of those rankings? It's too new for me to have gone through those things yet, but people will do that. And you know, there's the tax facts book that comes out every year that looks at all 50 states and where they rank and all the individual taxes. So we know, number one, um, reducing the income tax is going to help. Minnesotans, Minnesota's lowest tier income tax is actually higher 
than many states' highest tier. So we were taxing at the lowest level, much higher than many states at their highest level. So this is going to help with that. And then regarding the Social Security tax, uh, eliminating that will be helpful too. Can you talk a little bit more about why the quarter point off that first tier was so important? I mean, it doesn't amount to a ton of money for individuals, but it's obviously um, important to everybody out there. Can you talk a little bit about why that was so important? Well, that was important because, number one, it affects every Minnesotan. Every Minnesotan's income flows through that first tier. And we wanted to uh, make sure that every Minnesotan got a permanent ongoing uh, tax cut. Can one of, a, one of you speak to the specific changes for LGA and how you came to that amount? Sure. sure. Well, you go ahead. Yes, you're the property tax chair. Go ahead. Um, actually, where we started was wanting to um, fix the formula and adjust the formula, at least rebase it. The numbers are sitting there at around 2013. Uh, a lot of work was done um, in the spring, uh, fall and the winter in working with all the outside groups and, and our amazing nonpartisan staff that went through about 40 different regression models to make sure that we were calculating need right. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that part across the finish line. But knowing, as uh, Senator Weber said, Property taxes are about shifts, aids, and credits, and when you're shifting onto other properties or shifting to the city levies, and if you want what you're doing on the aid side to actually help, boosting up LGA was very important this year to make that up for the city. So we're looking at a, um, a hold harmless formula with money into it, and that we'll continue to work together um, next year to try to get that formula. So we're adequately addressing the needs, because LGA really is there so that there's basic needs across the state no matter what city you live in. You can flush a toilet, drive on a road, and call a first responder, and we want to make sure that you can all do that. So we need to just make sure that we're calculating that need right. And also I want to mention that uh, in addition to the LGA increases, we also have CPA increases. And in the Senate, we believe that it was important that that be at the same amount for the counties as it is for the cities. Over the years, the counties have been oftentimes uh, stuck uh, with those costs that the, the state has shifted to them, whether we're talking about child protection, court costs, a variety of things. And so uh, we believe that it was important that, that their uh, aids be increased at the same level uh, to uh, account for the increased costs that over the years the state has thrust upon them as well. And what was that level? $30 million a year. Um, each year? Each year for, account, for LGA and for CPA. Thank you. Um, both of you uh, mentioned right off the bat um, that you implore your colleagues to reach agreement. This is now out there. Um, they can see it. The public, of course, can see it. But, but your colleagues can see it. Do you think that this will have much of a difference? And how active a role are you willing to play in some of your colleagues who are on those conference committees that are really, really at loggerheads. Now, I'm thinking public safety and education. This right here, and what we've talked about right now, as I said, is going to have a real and meaningful impact on people's lives. I mean, this is historic, as we mentioned. And this is part of the big agreement, as you're saying, a big part, and nothing moves forward without all parts of the agreement getting done. And so I don't know how strongly we can say, I think we like this bill. This is, we yeah. would like to see this passed. Exactly. So I guess we would implore those that get yeah. moving. And we're both yeah. teachers, aren't we? Former teachers. Uh, we're and we're so both former teachers, yes. both former education get chairs. Your assignment get done. your work done. <laughs> get get your done. work done, get it in on time, and we can move forward. And I'll just say the tax conferees, we did our job. We did the $4 billion of tax relief. We did it in a way that impacts all Minnesotans. And it would be shameful if this got lost, all of this good tax relief. It would be shameful if this got lost in other negotiations. So this conference committee yeah. is ready to go. We've got tax relief package right here for every Minnesotan. And I think it's a great credit to the bipartisan approach that this committee has taken and uh, our leadership. I mean, we're now one of only two divided, you know, legislatures of the nation. You've got Governor Walls and Majority Leader Miller and Speaker of the House Portman coming together on a bipartisan fashion to get this done. As Senator Nelson said, it would be a shame not to get everything across the finish line, and I'm hoping we can do that. 
Do you all see this as a 50-50 split within the tax bill um, of Democratic and Republican priorities, or is one side more favored, or how do you do that? I would say it's a 50-50 split. I mean, there were some things that we yeah. all ag agreed upon. There were some things that we took from the House that we didn't have. They took some things from yeah. the Senate they didn't have. So it was, a, it was a good compromise. But I think at the end of the day, none of us took those things that were highly problematic. So uh, we, were, we were respectful. And we worked on the common good, the things that we knew we could all do together. Can Senator, Senator Bach talk about his bonding assignment? Well, let's ask him. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my press conference. <laughs> 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 but he was brave to come today. I had to calm yeah. down. Yeah. I think, is there anything more on the yeah. tax bill? <laughs> well, turn it over to bonding. Anything else? Yeah. I, do, I, just, turn it over. Yeah. I just did want to add, I can't help it, but you had asked about you all talking about the whole package, and that is what Chair Marquardt and Sean Nelson just said. It's the whole package. There's also said there's many other reasons why people leave the state. If you look at the state demographers, 18 to 25 year olds are the ones that leave and we need to entice them back. We need to entice them back with livable wages, entice them back with education systems that are funded so they wanna raise their kids here. The Great Start credit helps them before they get to school. We have to work on our higher ed system to get people to stay here too. So it all ties together and that's why it's so important that this is a package that ties together and that we all you know, the tax bill comes out last as the chair and Final chair question on taxes. Any last question? Oh, no, I just want to thank you very much. We have had a great uh, conference a committee, as I said, dedicated to really empowering Minnesotans, sparking economic growth, helping Minnesotans recover, and getting us uh, from not being such a, an island of high taxation. And so we've all worked hard, and we really cheer on and encourage our colleagues to continue with their good work and uh, get, the, get this across the finish line and, and hopefully some of those others as well. I thank Chair Mark for you. Thank well you done. very much. Excellent. Good job. Thank you. All right, thank you. Two yeah. I'm not gonna get away. <laughs> let, let me just say on the tax bill, uh, congratulations to the two tax chairs. When I was tax chair, I never got to do something of this size. Uh, but they've, they've done a very good job. It was an interesting conference committee because there were five former or current tax chairs on that conference committee of 10 people. I have never seen anything like that. There was an incredible amount of experience in tax policy sitting around that table. And I think that's uh, part of the reason you see the proposal is so balanced that helps kind of everybody. And I, I, I feel really good. I've always been a, a big fan of aid to cities and counties, you know, we, uh, the, the only mechanism they have to raise money is the property tax. And so, you know, the state has a lot of other ways we can raise money. So I, I just think, you know, the state created counties so that certain things could be delivered at the local level. And I've always felt, you know, we have some obligation to help them deliver on the kind of things that we're asking them to do. So the, the bill will make the state a stronger partner with our local governments, and, and, and I think that's important. Uh, and on this, on this Social Security issue, let me just say, you know, it's more than just the income tax we lose on someone's Social Security when they leave. Call any investment manager, and he will tell you that they advise seniors to leave Minnesota. That's what they tell them. I got a brother-in-law, they told that just in the last six months. That's what, they, they, in fact, their exact words are, you would be crazy to stay in Minnesota when you retire. And Social Security is part of the reason. And, but it's not just the Social Security income tax we lose when seniors leave. It is a factor they consider, but think about it. We lose the income tax on all of their investment income, on all of their other retirement and pension income. It is a big loss to the state's general fund when seniors leave. This isn't gonna solve that for everybody but it is gonna be one of the considerations that they won't have to think of, a family won't have to think of when they're making their decision about whether to leave or stay. So it's kind of what we can do. And uh, I, I just congratulate everybody in a bipartisan way for finally doing this, because we've been talking about it a long time. And on bonding, let me just say, uh, uh, we were given a target by leadership a week ago. Uh, we set out, uh, Representative Lee and myself, and Representative Erdahl and Senator Pappas, the four of us, uh, caucus leaders on bonding, uh, 
to put a bill together that had a heavy emphasis on, as, emphasis on asset preservation and deferred maintenance uh, here at our colleges and universities. I think we've accomplished, we're going to accomplish that. The, the $1.4 billion GO bill is going to be about a billion dollars of state agency stuff, much of which is asset preservation stuff across all of our, uh, all of our state infrastructure across the state. A lot of uh, road infrastructure, a lot of wastewater and water infrastructure, a lot of uh, work at our state college system that uh, we've been falling behind on. So we're very close to an agreement on that billion on the, on the, on the agency stuff. And then uh, the four of us are going to try to figure out among the 400 million left kind of what kind of agreement can we come to on what kind of local projects that we should fund. And that's hard. That's really hard because you can't, there, there's a lot of bills introduced. I think we've got, gosh, I want to say over 500 bills have been, been forwarded to the, the, the Capital Investment Committee. So we're not going to accommodate everything that, uh, uh, that local governments want for local infrastructure. But at $400 million, we're going to get a we're going to get a decent chunk of it. And then leadership also gave us $150 million of cash uh, that we're going to try and figure out, because uh, not everything's bondable. Uh, is there a way to do some things on some projects that uh, don't qualify for, for state bonding? I think we'll get to an agreement. Uh, I have talked to all, all four leaders in the last day about kind of a path to get out of here. Uh, and uh, we've had very good conversations. Uh, Represent or Senator Gazelka and I uh, actually met with uh, Majority Leader Miller today and talked about this very thing. Let's let's chart a path how we get out of here because uh, everything is linked. And kind of how do you choreograph which once bills close up, which one goes first, and what's the level of trust between leaders that uh, someone's not going to go home uh, and they're going to hang in there until everything gets done. So. But we're getting pretty late on time as it relates to the revisor's office and getting everything actually drafted and on members' desks. So um, by the end of today, if we're going to get out of here uh, Sunday night at midnight, things have to pretty much come together. I think we're pretty close to that happening. Uh, and the tax bill, other than adopting the actual formal uh, language in the conference committee, the money's all, all spent. That's so the revisers have a very early start on the tax bill. It's interesting, you know, one of the biggest bills, uh, half of the entire surplus, and that's the bill that's kind of out of the chute first to the reviser. So that one will be ready, but my guess is leadership are probably going to hold that one back until the agreement is finalized with the other budget provisions. But uh, it, it's, it's going to be a good session for Minnesotans. I mean, everybody's going to get something out of this. Uh, and. Uh, and then if you have to pick something that you feel best about, I think I would say that what we are going to do for long-term care is significant. We have a huge problem in our long-term care facilities with staffing. It is serious. And we are going, if we, unless the state does something, because unlike, and let me just say, unlike childcare, that can set their rates and they can raise their rates so that their business uh, can function, Long-term care facilities can't do that because the state sets the rates. So they can't possibly provide higher wages. They have no elasticity in the revenue stream. So we are at, I think, some serious risk of losing a lot of long-term care beds around the state, our most vulnerable people. And the Senate proposal has been very heavy on long-term care. Uh, Senator Abler has been just a champion for that. I think we're going to get that over the finish line in the, the Health and Human Service Bill. And you think about... The, you know, and Hubert Humphrey said it, the measure of a society is how they treat their most vulnerable people. We have a huge crisis in this state in that area. And there is a huge lifeline coming to them in the HHS bill this year. So not many to pick that the tax bill is not important. But taking care of our most vulnerable seniors is, I think, to every single person in the legislature, probably the most important thing we're going to do. Anyway, I'll give you an up we'll have an update on bonding again soon. I'm meeting with Representative Lee shortly. Uh, we met. Yes, Senator, um, everything else blows up, is bonding still going to happen? Can it happen on its own? It, it can. You know, this is, this is really the bonding bill actually is the thing that everyone expects is going to get done in uh, the, the election year. It, it, I mean, maybe it's the only thing that passes, you know. 
It could be that you know maybe everything else falls apart. Uh, I don't think so, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't think so. But you know it's not linked to the budget agreement, right? So it could, if we can get it ready, uh, it's something that we could pass. And you know historically it's kind of been the last bill out of town. That may not be the case this year because it's not linked to all of the other budget bills and the tax bill. So, and that certainly would be my goal is to try and get it passed before uh, adjournment on Sunday. Thank you. 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 Thank employers can adjust the withholding tables once this bill becomes law. Yes. So the answer to your question is yes, yes. then they could. They can or they have to? They, oh. Well, how quickly they can do it, we don't know. But it's, it will be effective for tax year 2022, which is paid in 23. Okay. So. That will be up to the Department of Revenue to update. Yeah, they'll have to. The Department of Revenue, there you go. We could start withholding less. Yes, as yes. yes. soon as it's signed. Yeah. And yeah. So, so it's not upon enactment, it's upon the Revenue Department. Oh, right. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. That With all the authority their... to do it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, one question we should have asked earlier. If everybody else can't get their stuff done, but they're really close. Will you guys hold that agreement up and say, special session, we, we got to do it if the yeah. clock is running out? I am a man of my word, and if there's an agreement made, an agreement has to be done. Nothing moves forward until everything is agreed upon. That's what an agreement's about. But would you push for a special session if it's just the clock running out? Well, we're going to get done. I just want to say tomorrow's my birthday, and my wish is before midnight that we get this tax bill and all of our other things done too. Yeah.